I'd like to call the Finance, Ways, and Means Committee to order for February 1st, 2022. Uh, what you just heard was the gavel starting pistol for the marathon uh, that we are beginning today. And Madam Clerk, could I get you to please call the roll? Representatives Campbell, Camper, Crawford, Faison, Freeman, Gant, Garrett, Gillespie, Hawk, Hicks, Lamar, Lambert, Lynn, Miller, Ogles, Sexton, Shaw, Sparks, Todd, Whitson, Williams, Wendell, Zachary, Vice Chairman Baum, Chairman Hazelwood. Here. Madam Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our very first meeting of this committee for the second part of the 112th General Assembly. Are there any personal orders before we begin? Any announcements? <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, before we begin today, we're our, our main order of business is to hear from Commissioner Ely with an overview of um, the budget from FNA. But I would like to take the opportunity with Commissioner Ely and his folks present, with uh, those of you on the committee and those of you who are watching to share a special video message um, with this committee. It comes from TINCO. That's the advocacy organization uh, that works with the DSPs. And for any of you who have watched this committee for any length of time or watched our work on the floor, you know that that has been a strong uh, commitment. It's one thing we look at this, this budget and we look at, at numbers, but I think it is a good reminder to know that behind these numbers, there are real people, real Tennesseans who are impacted, whose lives are changed by the decisions that we made here. So with that uh, introduction, I'd like for us to just take a minute and watch this video, please. My name is Sharon McDonald. I'm one of the house managers that work here for RHA, and I've been doing this for 20 years this March. Not only have I been in this field for 20 years, but I have a couple of cousins that I grew up with that had developmental issues. And we were taught when we were young to assist them and not limit them, to let them be able to live their full potential and do what they can do for themselves. And so I started this when I was a kid. And then when along come an opportunity to actually go out and help and service other individuals, I jumped at it. I just want to say thank you for um, noticing us and giving us the raise and we really appreciate it. That was very important. It shows us that we matter. And I just want to say on behalf of the people that I work with, my coworkers, I know we are very grateful. My name is April Turner and I've worked for Dawn of Hope for 11 years. Sometimes things that we do isn't looked at like for like health care or anything, but some of these people, if they didn't have us to help them, they wouldn't be able to live normal lives. So they really need this. And a lot of people don't want to do direct support care because you don't make as much as you make at other jobs. It's more rewarding, but they can't survive on what they make. Since my husband and I are both DSPs here, the pay increase helped us more than it would just one person. So it really, really it helped. My name is Betty Nelson. I work for Journey in Community Living. I've been here 15 years for full time, and then I went part time, so it'd be two years part time. The extra income, it's a big, it makes you be a more appreciative when you come to work. When the cost of living go up, uh, you can do things that you couldn't do at first. And it makes you feel good about your job when you come, that you know that somebody's appreciating us for what we do. I'm Tara Connor. I work for SERVE. And SERVES is a company where we assist people with disabilities. DSPs are very important because we have people who um, 
are in the company. You have some who have family members, but you also have some who don't have family members. And as DSPs, we become, sometimes we become to them, we're, we're family. That love that we give and that support that we give to them is much needed. You know, everybody needs that in their lives. In order for them to live the meaningful life, they need somebody to come in and assist them with that. And so it's important that we have DSPs. So the, the raise itself can show people that we, we need you in this community and we're willing to pay you what we need to pay you for you to come out to help support the people that need the help. My name is Darlene Higdon and I work for Easter Seals. The reason I got into this was I grew up watching my aunts and uncles and my dad and them take care of my grandma so I always knew I wanted to do something to help someone and this is my fourth time back I semi-retired last November and came back this July and I've done it off and on for 30 years I just want to thank you all who all was involved and thank you for just looking at this and you know having our back and being there for us because we really need it and I thank y'all my name's Christy I work at the Michael Dunn Center. I've been with Clyde for about seven years. I have two children, three beautiful grandchildren. Clyde actually comes home with me for the holidays and knows my family very well. To go in and work in a factory, you're lying in somebody else's pockets. Here, doing the job that we do, all we do is make their day better. We help them, they're sick, we take care of them. They're having a bad day, find it, find a way to turn it around because that's what's important. Everybody deserves to be happy. With the pay increase this year, it has ensured that I get to stay at Michael Dunn. I get to do what I enjoy. I get to stay in a job that fulfills me as much as it does them. Thank you. Thank you for the pay increase. Thank you for ensuring that I can continue to do what I love to do. Without it, I don't know if I could stay. Ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that uh, the people that we just saw are, are true heroes in the state. So um, again, we are so indebted to those folks who take care of our most vulnerable citizens in the state. And I am so proud of what we've been able to do to help those who help others' lives to be better. And I want to thank the commissioner publicly and the governor because one of the most exciting things in this budget for me was that uh, it includes another raise for those very deserving folks. So um, thank you. With that, we will go out of session and we will hear our uh, budget presentation from our illustrious commissioner of finance, Commissioner Ely and his cohorts there. So commissioner. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Hazelwood and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I, I am uh, Butch Ely with FNA, and with me here today is our budget director, Dave Thurman, our assistant budget director, Alex Schumann, and it's an honor to be here uh, with you today to talk about the governor's proposed um, fiscal year 23 budget. Uh, before I do that, um, Chair Hazelwood, uh, I want to thank you for for reminding us of why we're here, and uh, that was a uh, that was a great video to do that, and um, that is that is why we're here, and um, it also reminds us that uh, you're you're exactly right that these direct service providers are the true uh, heroes, and uh, and we appreciate what they what they do day in day out. Uh, so uh, I want to um, I want to start with saying that uh, I know that all of you are very familiar with the normal budget process and uh, the traditional budget process, and we start this year. Um, but as we all know, this has been a tumultuous couple of years, and when we see people like this, we're reminded of. Uh, of, of really what people are facing day in, day out, and have been for the last couple of years. So uh, I believe telling the story of really how we got to where we are today uh, is helpful context 
for talking about where we're headed in the future. And so uh, I'm going to take a, a, a little bit of time talking about the background of how we got to where we are. Uh, I want to I want to start with um, reminding us, uh, I did this last year, um, that we are ranked number one in the nation for long-term fiscal stability. And uh, it's not just happenstance that we got here. It's not something that the governor or a commissioner can do alone. It's really a testament uh, to the great working relationship between the executive and legislative branches to provide that uh, sound financial management that uh, the oversight of this, this committee and this body has, uh, has given over the years. Uh, what, we're, what we're proposing today is a fiscally conservative budget, uh, but it's also a budget that, uh, uh, that helps uh, people in Tennessee uh, that you've seen here today. Um, the first thing I want to uh, talk about is uh, some of the things that are facing us today that we that we didn't face last year. Uh, I'm going to kind of start this economic story by showing a chart that I found helpful, um, and it's it's a it's a slide that legislative fiscal review staff uh, presented this past fall at the funding board meeting. And it depicts the consumer price index from 2008 until uh, through this past year. As you can see, there's been a dramatic uh, increase in CPI since the recession of 2020. It's no surprise uh, to anyone here, but it's uh, it's what all Tennesseans have been uh, facing here uh, this this past few months in the sharp increase of uh, prices of everything. Uh, this is a slide from Dr. Fox from UT's Center for Business and e Economic Development. I know uh, everybody here knows Dr. Fox, but you can see here the revenue growth uh, remains strong. And so we've certainly seen our revenue collections coming in uh, over this past uh, year be very strong. And this, this sharp uh, spike depicts that. We've gone, though, from in 20. Uh, 2020 uh, is as much as a 15% almost negative uh, growth uh, to a 50% growth rate in a period of less than two years. So it just shows uh, the variability uh, of that revenue growth. Uh, this, this is an interesting slide as well that uh, comes from Dr. Fox that shows the normal distribution a sales tax growth that uh, uh, goes from the period of 2011 to 2019. And you can see here uh, how predictable uh, those bars are that shows uh, the durable goods, non-durable goods, and services uh, between those critical categories. Uh, if you look here, though, this is the same categories between 2019 and 2021. And uh, you see here uh, the extraordinary purchasing during this time, especially in durable goods. And this is important to us because uh, we, we really rely on that very predictable cadence uh, of purchases over a series of years for our revenue, uh, for our revenue growth. And so you see here how much durable goods uh, are up there in that center bar and things like cars, uh, boats or RVs or any of those uh, uh, durable goods that are things that we don't purchase every year. And so uh, these, this is important to us as we put together this budget, recognizing that we can't build a budget around that high spike in revenue that we have seen uh, briefly, uh, briefly last year and part of this year. Um, and it's important that we uh, that we make sure that we've got uh, stable spending patterns that we uh, are budgeting from. Uh, some of you uh, were able to uh, to participate or to see the funding board meeting this past November. It was very helpful to us as we uh, put together the budget and helped inform us. Um, 
hearing from the economists that we have here in the state and the Federal Reserve is always helpful. And so I've got a couple of clips. I, I want to help set the tone if you were not able to be in that. And so this is uh, Dr. Fox. Recurring growth that's underlying all of this is much lower than what we've seen. And so one of my real fears is that either there is a significant increase in recurring spending, thinking that all this growth is recurring, or a reduction in tax rates. Either one, they have the same impact on, on the budget, right? Uh, and, and, and I'm fearful that, that way too much of this will be viewed as recurring. So what does this mean? This is, uh, this is another slide I found helpful from uh, Fiscal Review, and this shows sales tax growth. And what it basically informed us is that we really should not rely on that extraordinary growth that we've seen recently uh, to be here in the coming years. Um, so this shows, as you, as you can see, uh, what we've had recently in the last year or so, those blue bars, uh, and then you can see what uh, Fiscal Review has forecast uh, for, for, for this year, uh, for the remainder of this year, um, or part of this year. And it certainly uh, shows a downturn in that, uh, in that growth rate and something that uh, I believe is probably pretty on target. Uh, here, here's Fiscal Review at that, uh, at that funding board meeting with a quick uh, clip. I'm certainly more confident in, in the current fiscal year number. Now, just looking at uh, the way tax revenues have been coming in year to date, I'm very confident. Uh, going into next year, I think there's, uh, you know, as we keep saying, there's much more uncertainty of what's going to happen with inflation, what's going to happen with the labor force uh, participation. So he is, he's talking there, remember this was in November and so he's he's talking about fiscal year 22 being uh, comfortable with the the growth rates and uh, uh, that they were predicting. But he's saying in the next year that uh, we've got a lot more uh, volatility in those numbers. Uh, last, this is the last uh, quick clip. Another the question from is Dr. Fox: When a rebalancing of spending takes place. And, and I'll, I'll admit, I don't know when that's going to take place. I wish I could just sit here and say it's going to be on this day. What I do expect is going to happen. People are going to re revert to consumption levels that are more in line with their income levels. And, and at that point, we're going to see tax revenue growth slow down significantly. So that is a, uh, that's, a, that's, a quick, um, that, that's a quick reminder of how we got to where we are and kind of what has been shaping our thinking over this last year and these last few months as we developed this budget. Nearly two years ago, collaborating with this committee and, and the legislature, we embarked on a multi-year plan to prepare for weathering whatever storm came our way. And there were two major components. There were a number of, of pieces to that plan, but uh, two major components were we're limiting our growth and the speed of our growth and, and preserving cash uh, for, uh, for what we knew that we might need to do. And that plan certainly has worked. Uh, the actions that, uh, that we took um, in the last two years have been uh, fruitful. Uh, the hiring freeze that we did at the beginning, uh, vacancy reductions, pulling back on recurring growth have proven uh, wise. We're now comfortable though, being able to move forward in proposing some very strategic investments uh, that continue to be able to return to the pre-pandemic priorities and initiatives that the governor was looking forward to uh, a couple of years ago. Investing in what works and focusing on outcomes for all Tennesseans. So as I present here before you today, we're definitely in a much more uh, favorable position, uh, but still I think it's a, it's a good lesson for us to continue uh, with this multi-year mentality, um, not from the standpoint of a balanced budget, we certainly have that balanced budget, but a plan to ensure 
that we know what the new normal is from a revenue standpoint uh, as we move forward in the budgeting process. Uh, now, here's kind of the brass tacks. Um, here's what the revenues, the new revenues are that we have available to us and uh, what we're gonna be proposing to allocate. Um, the, 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 first, uh, the first column there on the left-hand side of the ledger is the recurring dollars. We have $3.5 billion made up of, uh, of several things, including our increased economic growth over collections from last year. And of course, this also includes the funds uh, from, from uh, the year, this year that we uh, purposefully did not spend on recurring expenditures uh, that returned to us uh, in this budget process for us to be able to utilize this year. So as you recall, last year we had uh, funds that uh, were recurring funds that we put into non-recurring spending uh, so that it would revert back to this year's budget. And we're doing the same thing this year, recommending that we do the same thing this year, but even in a bigger way. Uh, the non-recurring side of the ledger is 4.3 billion. Uh, it's also made up of over collections from fiscal year 21, as well as including collections that we're receiving in this current fiscal year that are over and above uh, the funding board estimates that uh, that we previously estimated. So we'll be we'll be going through the cost uh, cost increases in a moment. But what you see here on this chart, uh, we are deliberately ensuring that more than 1.3 billion of recurring revenue is allocated to one-time expenditures. That is very significant uh, thing. I think last year was the first year uh, that we used this, uh, this, this mechanism or this concept allowing the return of this 1.3 uh, to come back into the budget next year for review and budgeting uh, next fiscal year with this body and using those funds in, not, in a non-recurring way. Uh, this, this practice certainly affords us the opportunity to deal with these uh, various uh, revenue levels that we uh, that we just saw, uh, so um, we use a lot of budgetary terms as uh, as we put together the budget that all of you are familiar with, from recurring, non-recurring, and as I think about this process, uh, one thing that uh, that I continually remind our folks is that. Uh, just because we use these terms and we use the term recurring in our budget process uh, certainly does not guarantee in any way, shape, or form that uh, that, that money will definitely be recurring next year. And so we've, we've always got to be thinking through that process uh, and be careful that, uh, that we know and have a level set of what those recurring revenues might be. This next slide uh, shows the comparison of total budget uh, looking year over year. So you see fiscal year 22 on the left and fiscal year 23 recommended on the right, about a 2.5% uh, between those years. And um, one of the things that, that you see there uh, very clearly is in the green is our federal spending. And so that continues to increase and is largely made up of uh, the federal funds that we've been receiving um, in, in federal stimulus uh, due to the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, we were receiving around 14 billion per year uh, or so in federal spending. And uh, you see that this figure is hovering around 20 billion. Uh, we expect uh, that 23, uh, 19 or 20 to uh, likely increase as uh, as the year comes forward uh, for more uh, federal stimulus or federal spending that would uh, be coming. Um, but it it clearly will take uh, multiple uh, years for our departments that are receiving these funds to to work these expenditures through the process. All of this, uh, all these dollars and the spending. Uh, is is going through the the financial stimulus accountability group. Uh, it's made up of uh, 
of, of members of the legislature as well as the governor and myself and the constitutionals. And so for that to work its way through the departments and the departments have multiple years uh, to spend those funds now in this in this last set of funding that's come through. And so it'll be it'll be a few years before we work our way back down to where that fe federal funding funding goes uh, back to what it was prior to the pandemic. Um, and I, I also just mentioned uh, FYI that uh, on the on the FNA website, uh, you can go on at any time. 24 seven and there's a link there that shows uh, all of that federal funding funding and what it's being used for. So uh, anyone can do that at any time. In fiscal year 23, you can also see that uh, the state funding bumps up from 22. And this is a combination of, of both uh, increase in recurring funding and mainly uh, non-recurring dollars. Uh, that we're in a position to now allocate after holding back on growth as we did. It also represents the increased revenue collections uh, that we've seen that we spoke about earlier. Uh, so now let's kind of get down to, to some of the nitty gritty of the uh, areas of spending. Uh, I'm gonna go through some targeted investments in different areas. It's important uh, to remember that this is this is not an exhausted list. Uh, all of you have uh, the total, the total budget and uh, the total list. But here are some items of interest, and we can discuss. Uh, we can discuss those later. Uh, you've heard the governor talk uh, for several years regarding his commitment to education. Last night, you heard his plan for a new funding formula, as well as his commitment to over a billion dollars of new recurring. K through 12 funding. Uh, so that's represented uh, in this budget. This uh, budget funds a $750 million increase to K-12 spending to support that formula when finalized, as well as uh, fully funds an additional uh, $70 million in the BEP for the existing year. Uh, even though that 750 will not take place officially to fiscal year 24 budget, uh, we wanted to make sure we demonstrated our commitment to those funds being available in 24. So we're putting those funding, uh, those funds into uh, the budget as recurring, but we're using the funds this year in 23, that 750 million for non-recurring spending items. And uh, the biggest bulk of that is going to be in career and technical education grants. Uh, so, so you see these next two categories here, uh, career and technical and relocating uh, schools from the floodplains make up that 750, that would be one-time funding, but it'll recur. So it'll be there next year uh, to put in the formula. Um, focusing on the career and technical, uh, what, this, what this allows for is for every high school and every combination school to receive around a uh, million dollars in career and technical grants uh, to those schools and approximately 500,000 that would go to middle schools to help purchase new equipment and uh, set up those uh, schools for those uh, uh, to be able to teach those uh, areas. Uh, we're also proposing to allocate 200 million that'll go to help relocate every public school in a floodplain. Uh, we learned this through the uh, the flooding in Waverly recently, and learned that there were actually 14 schools. Uh, that had previously be, been built in such a zone. And so uh, we're going to help, uh, help those districts be able to locate those schools and, uh, and, and make sure uh, that we do that. And so we're, uh, we've set aside $200 million uh, toward being able to do that in this budget. Um, we're also proposing $125 million investment to the salary component uh, of instructional staff, recognizing the outstanding work 
that is being done day to in and day out for that. We're continuing to invest in the charter school facility funding um, to assist in the high performing charter schools that uh, are there. And we're proposing 16 million uh, this year in recurring and 16 million in non-recurring. Next, uh, looking at higher ed, uh, we're fully funding our outcomes-based formula. That is $90 million to do that. Uh, we believe firmly that the success of students in our institutions of higher learning is directly proportional and correlating to our state's future economic development. You heard the governor last night uh, address this and say that he fully anticipates that this will result in a 0% tuition increase at each of our uh, public institutions of higher education. Obviously, this will also make uh, college uh, much more affordable to our Tennessee students. Also along those lines, we're happy to be able to propose an increase in the HOPE scholarship to $5,100 uh, per year for each of our four-year institutions and $3,200 per year for two-year institutions. We can do this because the Tennessee Promise reserves have now grown enough so that the earnings will exceed the program cost by almost $15 million in fiscal year 24 after uh, making these changes to the HOPE scholarship amounts that, uh, that the governor is proposing. Also part of that investment is $250 million to uh, Tennessee State University for fiscal infrastructure improvements. Uh, the state investment paired with uh, investment from TSU that includes a strong and consistent maintenance plan will help us ensure that our public HBCU continues attracting and retaining top talent for careers that will help propel Tennessee forward. To ensure we have the learning environments uh, for tomorrow's careers, we're also proposing the largest strategic capital investment in history. On top of that, we're proposing 200 million for fiscal improvements in 10 critical TCATs to help, help toward doubling our output for skilled, care, uh, for skilled workforce by 2026. We're also proposing to complete construction of the UT Oak Ridge Innovation uh, Institute. As you will recall, we begin funding that uh, this current fiscal year. And this is a center that will grow Tennessee's talent pipeline for scientists and engineers focusing on advanced materials and quantum computing. Uh, remember this center also is being matched $7 for every dollar of our state investment. And finally, we're recommending $50 million toward $100 million in research funding at the University of Memphis. This one-to-one -one matched fund will ensure an R1 designation uh, in each of our four, uh, in each of our three grand divisions across the state. Now looking at transportation and infrastructure. As the governor mentioned last night, our state, as you know, is one of the fastest growing states in the country. We have an obligation to future generations to be able to invest in our roads and bridges to ensure that economic opportunity. We'll simply not be able to continue to attract world-class jobs without providing world-class mobility. Um, we will uh, find ourselves really in a unique, unique position this year to be able to enhance what we're already doing through highway funds by utilizing additional general fund dollars for road projects. As this body knows, the IMPROVE Act was uh, not indexed and the timeline for completion continues to lengthen. To assist with this, we're proposing $100 million for IMPROVE Act projects. And we believe that this investment coupled with additional dollars that we will receive uh, from the recent federal infrastructure law will allow us uh, to accelerate a number of those projects being done. We're also investing in several economic development related projects that the Department of Transportation 
uh, is proposing uh, in partnership with local governments across the state, along with a number of rural interchange improvements uh, that will be able to be made with these dollars. Um, I think you've got the list, the total list uh, in front of you in the overview, and um, TDOT is certainly equipped and will be uh, discussing these in more detail um, as we as we move along through the budget process. Let me talk briefly about uh, the rainy day and other liability reductions. Uh, this is a major investment as well. While many states, as you know, are struggling uh, to meet their obligations, uh, we're in a position in proposing to transfer over $600 million in this budget to reduce our pension and insurance liability. These will be one-time uh, one time cost uh, that will that we will reduce uh, in these both of these plans. Um, and during our multi-year plan, uh, in addition to that, you will recall we authorized uh, $221 million in bonds as part of our uh, effort to hold back uh, cash in case we needed it. Uh, we now find ourselves in a position that we can cover those costs, cover instead of doing bonds, we can pay for those projects with cash. And so we're uh, proposing to replace uh, the potential bond outlay uh, with a cash outlay uh, for that $221 million. What this all means uh, that is impressive is that our debt ratio or our debt as a percentage of taxes is actually only 1.5 percent, uh, which I'm not sure of any other state can uh, can say that, but a uh, huge, huge benefit to our taxpayers. Uh, next, I want to look uh, very quickly at our rainy day fund. Um, this fund continues to play a very large role in our AAA bond rating, and really because of your forethought uh, in this body, um, this fund, as you know, we uh, talked last year, uh, this fund by statute is our fund of last resort. And um, so now combined with the 10 care reserve, our final fiscal year 23 balances for our largest reserves will now be over $2 billion dollars. Um, and so, uh, so we're, we're glad to be able to make sure that we have those funds available when needed. Uh, on health and social services, um, certainly been in the forefront over these last couple of years. A few highlights, uh, you've heard the governor say time and again, hospitals and our providers uh, that we saw some of earlier have been great partners throughout this pandemic. Uh, helping those citizens most in need. Uh, we're ensuring that our hospitals, our public hospitals, uh, receive funding for uncompensated care, helping them serve more Tennesseans throughout the state. We're also proposing over $90 million in provider rate increases, uh, acknowledging that our services are only as good as our extraordinary partners and we certainly want to help them strengthen uh, their existing networks and our networks. To help us recruit more primary care providers and permit greater access for Tennesseans to get, a health, uh, to get ahead of the health curve, we're proposing $18 million for an additional 150 primary care residents. We wanna help train them here. And we certainly wanna help keep them here uh, as they go into their profession. To aid in increasing uh, the dental health of our citizens, uh, which has a direct correlation to increased overall health, uh, as well as livelihoods, we're making a multi-year commitment to recruit and retain more high quality dental providers to our state. At the same time, we're proposing to add dental benefits for adults on TennCare which will cover an additional 610,000 Tennesseans uh, for those services. We're also proposing over $55 million for Pathways to Independence Program. The goal of this investment is to serve targeted populations of elderly and youth with disabilities in home and community-based settings. 
as well as independent living services to support their health and independence. We also believe that enactment of these services will help these individuals uh, remain off the Medicaid uh, rolls. Finally, as this body knows, uh, TEIS, which y'all are all familiar with, our early intervention program at DIDD is a critical program that provides services to children ages birth up to three years old. These children have disabilities or other developmental delays. Uh, and so we're proposing extending these services another year up to the child's fourth birthday, helping to better support these young children and their families to reach optimal development. Both the 10 care adult dental, dental benefits and pathways to independence programs are eligible for the ARP funds, uh, the federal funds in the uh, American Res Rescue Plan. We will bring these uh, to the FSAG uh, in the coming months uh, in February or March, uh, as well as additional proposals related to mental health and substance abuse services. Uh, but we're making these today in recurring investments to ensure that these services continue uh, when the federal funding ceases. Uh, next, let's talk a little bit about law and safety. You heard the governor uh, speak about his unwavering commitment to law enforcement, first responders, and safer communities. The governor's budget proposes adding 100 new trooper positions to better serve Tennesseans and ensure greater coverage areas around the state and also to respond to requests for assistance more quickly. To better assist with crime investigations, we're proposing the largest ever one-time increase in TBI, adding 20 agents for cyber investigations, human trafficking, and the narcotics division, as well as 30 forensic scientists uh, for the uh, labs that are much needed. Our troopers and TBI agents, though, cannot do their job alone. They depend on strong local law enforcement across Tennessee to help carry out their mission. To that end, we're proposing additional hiring funding for local communities to recruit and retain the best for law enforcement positions. To better serve all those safety-related personnel from across our state, we're also recommending to centralize our training to provide our officers and staff with the highest possible instruction and training possible. Uh, this will be done through the multi-agency law enforcement training academy, which will be located in our state-owned property out at Cockrell Bend, and it'll bring together uh, all these state agencies to work together alongside one another in keeping our communities safe. Our cities and counties are on the forefront of making sure communities are safe. To continue providing support for our local partners, we're tailoring our state and local community grant program specifically to provide support to help reduce crime in communities across the state. Finally, it's vital for our safety personnel and first responders to be able to communicate with one another. We unfortunately have large gaps around the state in certain areas in, in our Tennessee Advanced Communications Network, or TACN. Officials, uh, these officers are often uh, or sometimes unable to utilize the radio to communicate to anyone else. These gaps are unacceptable and pose a risk not only to the officers, uh, but also the communities that they serve. So we're proposing $179 million in this budget that will complete the full construction of the TACN infrastructure so that any first responder will be able to communicate with any other first responder any place, uh, any time. Uh, and now uh, capital investments, uh, you heard me say at the outset that uh, we were going to go big on one-time spending. We believe that capital is a good investment to be able to move our state forward. We've had a lot of deferred uh, maintenance over the years, so we uh, feel like this is a good investment. We're recommending 
$2.7 billion in capital improvements and capital maintenance. Our workforce in higher ed have certainly uh, involved, uh, evolved during the past two years, but as we know, there's still a need for providing in-person services and learning. Uh, we're not proposing to invest in bricks and mortar uh, just because we have the money to do so. We're being very deliberate in what we build, where we build it, and when we build it. Also for general government, we're upgrading our state park system. Many of you are aware uh, or, or have seen firsthand significant deferred maintenance over the years. We're, we're making further investment in our state parks to improve the visitor experience, attract additional tourism, and to expand our economic growth in the rural communities where those parks are. We need to continue making our parks world-class, and as y'all know, they've, uh, we've had the most visitors uh, ever in our parks uh, over the last year or so, and it's been a great refuge for Tennesseans to be able to enjoy. We're also upgrading and maintaining our veterans' cemeteries, also providing secure and functional facilities for our military department, providing various maintenance and repairs to ensure the state Correctional facilities are safe and secure. I've already explained what we're doing with law enforcement, with Melita. And, you know, one thing we've certainly learned, I think, is that deferring maintenance is not a good strategy. Maintaining our assets well will save us money in the long run. In regard to higher ed, uh, this year's higher ed capital investment is the largest in our state's history. It reflects the campus master plans, the state's higher ed attainment goals, and aligns with our current local workforce needs. It includes substantial renovations to buildings on our campuses that will extend the functional life and reduce future maintenance of these facilities. New construction will train students in high need fields in state-of-the-art, well-equipped facilities. It also reflects lessons learned uh, from COVID. For example, the need for flexible space and options for what courses can and should be offered in what settings. Our goal is simple, to make strategic investments that will improve our overall economic prosperity while at the same time managing the life cycle of these assets. The first question that you'll probably ask is, can all this be done in one year? And certainly the answer is no. And we know that, but we know that these are projects of significant importance. And given the resources available, our focus on one time, these, uh, this larger capital investment docket was a way for us to achieve our collective goals of strategic investment rather than growing the base too quickly. A lot of, uh, several of you have asked about uh, TCAT expansions. Uh, the previous higher ed slide highlighted 200 million in recommended funding for TCAT equipment and facility improvements to help toward doubling that skilled workforce output by 2026. Uh, here's the list on the left-hand side uh, of those campuses that are shown in this budget document. You'll also see 647 million under f a for capital expenditures. This is a placeholder for four distinct projects that were continued to evaluate the scope and the cost in the most efficient delivery model for these four projects. Moxon Bend Mental Health Institute, the Wilder Youth Development Center, and Tima Emergency Operations Center have all, all have issues that need to be addressed. Many of you uh, in, in, in your communities have spoken to me about these projects and all of your communities rely also on our team of headquarters uh, to function seamlessly during disasters. We also need a home for our emergency supplies. Right now, our team of warehouse is in an indoor parking lot. Every state had to hustle in order to get the supplies they needed during the, the pandemic. Uh, we're exploring our options, working with TEMA to make sure that we can help our communities 
that are in need. Acknowledging these issues need to be solved in fiscal year 23, but also recognizing that more work needs to be done before the final plans are made. We're proposing to set aside funding for these projects to ensure that resources are available sooner rather than later so that we can proceed forward when the details are worked out. I'll personally work uh, with this body, the speakers, constitutional officers, and members of the Building Commission on these plans to ensure that we're all working together as these projects commence. This is a little a unique request, but certainly it's our solution to problems that need to be solved quickly, yet have several variables to be worked out. Uh, in closing, um, I want to again thank you for today um, and the time to be able to spend on this budget. Um, I also want to thank uh, this committee for its leadership uh, and really more so the partnership uh, that we've had together uh, during this last couple of years during this uh, critical and challenging time. Uh, I'll leave you with this message on the budget. Uh, the budget that uh, you have before you is fully balanced. Uh, the budget has zero debt. It prioritizes one-time expenses to mitigate those uncertainties that we discussed at the beginning of this presentation. It targets programs that work, that are evidence-based, and more than ever, it invests in Tennessee. Chairman Hazelwood, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and we're happy to answer questions. If, uh, if I don't know the answer, then uh, one of these guys hopefully does, and all of our departments are eager to, uh, to talk to you in, in their own budget presentations and uh, certainly can shed more detail on some of these items than we will. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. It's, um, as you have pointed out, and I think we all realized last night when the governor's presentation, these truly are unprecedented numbers. This truly is an unprecedented time. And I would just like to remind this committee and all members of the House and of the legislative body that we have, are in a good position because we have been a fis fiscally conservative state from administration to General Assembly for years. And I would hope and will do my best to make sure that we continue to do that realizing we do have unprecedented monies, but also realizing that just because you have money, you don't have to spend it all. And I appreciate um, the dollars set aside in the various ways that we've talked about, um, that the commissioners talked about here. I'll open up with just sort of an overarching question, and then we have uh, several people on the list. But when we look at, at these numbers, um, I, I, my question is a number of these are, are fairly long-term projects. You can't do these major capital projects um, in a year. And so what inflationary factor are we using to make sure that we are actually budgeting enough money to bring the project to completion? Because, uh, you know, as you and I've talked, Commissioner, billion dollars doesn't buy what it <laughs> once did, and it's not going to buy even as much um, this time yeah. next year. So um, just talk with us about how we're accounting for that. And also, um, I guess, related or just a flip side of the inflationary issue is the fact that uh, a lot of states, a lot of companies are going to be chasing the same supplies. And so you have that scarcity and um, supply chain issues. So yeah. if you could address that. Well, it's, it's, uh, it, it's certainly a, a good question. And I think that uh, we've already seen, you know, just in this past year, uh, inflation um, fairly rampant on the construction side and building side. And so um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. It's already it's beginning to uh, to tamp down some, but um, we have we we've certainly encouraged uh, the Department of General Services as they bring these uh, projects forward to continue to look at, at inflation and they have, they have put inflation factors into uh, all of these numbers. And in the, then in addition uh, to inflation, they are also uh, adding a contingency factor on each of the projects that they bring forward. Uh, I would 
I would I would say that uh, that would it'd be a good question to to pose to general services to make sure that uh, you're able to hear firsthand from them on the process that they go through to do that. Uh, but but I will assure you, and we've been assured that uh, they are looking both at inflation and making sure that they put an inflation factor into each one of those uh, estimates, as well as putting additional contingency on top of that, uh, just to be able to assure, uh, try to ensure that we are prepared uh, for what happens on that front. Thank you. Um, Chairman Todd, you're first on my list. Thank you, Chair Lady. Commissioner, appreciate you and your folks being here today. Um, in this proposed budget increase of about $10 billion over the current base budget that we approved almost 10 months ago, is there any, return, any money returned to the taxpayers by means of tax cuts? Uh, no, sir. Um, we deliberately uh, did not did not put any additional or, or any any uh, tax cuts into this. Really, for the reason that uh, we discussed at the beginning of this uh, of this uh, presentation, and that is uh, the variation, the wide variation that we've seen in um, in our tax collections uh, over this last uh, year or so. Um, I for I for one am uh, would be a big proponent of of looking at, at tax cuts. I know the governor, uh, as as you well know, uh, believes in as small a government as possible and putting as much money back to our taxpayers as possible. But uh, I do not feel that this is the year to do that because of the variations and the uncertainties that we've heard from all the experts about what uh, what it may look like next year. We've had times in our past uh, in Tennessee where we have um, had estimates that we've not met and we've had to make a number of cuts in mid-year. Um, and so uh, certainly not opposed to tax cuts. would welcome being able to do that and would anticipate that we may be able to do that next year. Uh, in areas that uh, would make sense. Uh, as uh, Chair Hazelwood said, we, we're going to have a <clears> billion <throat> three coming back in next year uh, in, into the budget to be allocated next year. And uh, I think we'll have a lot better sense next year uh, what our level set actually is on revenues and uh, can be able to entertain that. So. Thank you, Chair Lady. Um, one, one more question. Yes, certainly. Uh, based on the staggering inflation brought on by the Biden administration's uh, taxing and spending spree here lately, do you believe the buying power of the rainy day fund will stay the same or increase with only $50 billion added to it? 50 million. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a good question too. I think that what we've tried to do is, uh, is, as you saw on the chart, um, we've drastically increased the size of our rainy day fund um, over the last few years, uh, and especially over the last three years since uh, Governor Lee has been here. Um, there's a there's a target that the legislature posed uh, for a target to the rainy day fund, which this meets. And if if you compare, uh, if you add the the additional funds for the uh, ten care reserve, it exceeds. It's, uh, it exceeds those. Um, we could have put the $600 million uh, for the, the pension liabilities uh, into rainy day. Uh, that, that would be, uh, it would have been an option. Uh, we felt like that it was important to, to kind of buy down those liabilities that are, that are real and are out there um, that we're going to be continuing to pay every year for a number of years and that it was a better investment to buy down those liabilities than it was uh, to stick to stick additional dollars right now into the rainy day fund. And so that was the thinking behind that process. Um, it allows us to cut the number of years that we're continuing to pay uh, to pay those uh, increased liabilities. And as, as, as you're pointing out, 
Um, the longer we have those liabilities sitting out there, uh, which ours is much, much less, as you all know, than most every other state uh, for our pension liabilities, um, because of inflation, those liabilities will continue to increase. And so it makes smarter sense to me to buy down those liabilities uh, than stick more money in the in the uh, rainy day fund at this point. Um, certainly next year when it rolls around, we'll be able to re, re, uh, re look at that. So. Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I could, uh, a couple and possibly three questions. I, I think Chair Lady Hazelwood wins the quote of the day when she said a billion dollars doesn't buy what it <laughs> used to. I wrote that down. That's <laughs> that's true, as, yeah. as Chairman Todd was referring to a few moments ago. That, that's amazing how true that is. If I could take us back, and somewhat on Chairman Todd's points, back on slide 14, as we are looking at the budget document we passed um, that we're currently in that we passed in May of 21. And we, we are, we have seen nine or $10 billion more invested in this current budget document that we're in. And you all have done a really good job, very transparent job getting us that information. But if we could get a, maybe a breakdown as to what the additional spending is there from, from when we left May, although we had special sessions, but when we left May of 21, yeah. how we've added to the budget to get to the numbers we are right now. If we could get some documentation on that, and I don't know if there's a short answer now or maybe some information to get us later. Yeah, we, we certainly will do that. As you as, as you all have pointed out, um, that number is considerably higher than it was uh, a year ago when, when passed. And so um, most of that is, is certainly due to the federal, uh, large amount of federal funds that have come in. And I know that that, that um, those funds are all on that website. You want to you want to address this anymore? Uh, or, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, and just to also add, uh, since the budget passed in May, we had the special session on the on the Blue Oval, and that was a significant increase to the to the budget as well. So, but we can get that to you. Thank we, you. Thank you. If I could, Madam Chair, a couple more. Um, as we move on to page 16 of the of the slide presentation as well, uh, my friends in higher ed, myself included, were just ecstatic. So a lot of smiles in the in the room and, and rooms across the state. So uh, tremendous uh, opportunity for us to make some investments in higher ed here as well. Tell me about the increase in the HOPE Award. And, and it, you certainly piqued my ears when $5,100 for a four-year institution, $3,200 for two-year institutions. And, and the reason I say that, there's as we're looking to hit the drive to 55, as we're looking to, to try to get our 55% our, uh, of our population with some type of higher ed degree certification, two years, you know, technology center, community college, four-year institution, I'm I'm wondering if there's a segment of the population that we may be leaving out. And, and if this has been discussed or thought, you've got a group of collegiate freshmen uh, and maybe some folks who have had that HOPE scholarship one time, lost it after a year, and there's really no incentive for them to uh, to buy that or to, to earn that HOPE scholarship back. Uh, maybe that's something that we could look at instead of just writing off the 25, 20, 30 percent of, of the population that lose it as freshmen freshmen and never come back in. Uh, if we could give some thought to that, a potential earn back of the HOPE scholarship, I don't know if that changes that number, but but that's something that I would like to look into and, and maybe discuss with some legislation. Any thoughts on that or, or give me the thought process on increasing the, the award for HOPE scholarship? Yeah. Well, my initial thought is, uh, I, I think what you're saying is interesting and, I, and, and, and I'm favorable to think about it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not an expert. We ought to talk to, to THEC and to, uh, did you have any, any ideas on what he's saying that would? Well, uh, so the, the, the awards have been kind of set for the last stagnant. seven years. Um, and it was a result of the trying to get the promise program in a, in a strong financial standing. 
in terms of the balance so that the so that the the reserves endowments would generate enough uh, earned income to fully fund the, the promise program and so now that, that program is uh, it appears to be in a really good financial situation from a, a interest earning standpoint uh, felt it was appropriate to kind of revisit the scholarship awards and, and adjust uh, based on you know inflation and, and change that's occurred over the last seven years so Thank you. And just one follow up since we're on that, the source of these funds of the $75.2 million increase in Hope Awards, is it from lottery proceeds or are we including the online sports betting dollars in there as well? So it's a it's mainly lottery, but uh, there are, uh, as part of the, the those dollars, the lot, the uh, sports gaming is, is currently deposited into the, uh, I guess, based on law, into the net proceeds and available for uh, uh, for scholarships. So, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned under public safety, uh, $355 million training academy. To me, that's that's a lot of money. I'll just say that. Um, one of the biggest, I think, roadblocks to public safety, not just in Shelby County, East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, probably across this country, is recruitment of police officers. An example, in Memphis, I think, uh, they're recruiting with a $15,000 sign-on bonus. Right now, I think we're between either 250 or 700 officers short. And when we recruit new officers, we have a pretty good training before they become police officers. And I'm sure the same thing is in Davidson County, Knox County, you name it. Would you and the governor consider spending some of that $355 million, because I'm assuming this is for a building for the most part, would you consider allocating or putting some of those resources exactly where crime to some extent occurs in the communities? Mm -hmm that we are serving. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, I, I thought. Again, would you consider putting yeah. some of those resources across this state, in the police departments across this state, as opposed to spending $355 million on a training academy, which I don't quite understand exactly what you're yeah. trying to get from this. Well. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I don't think that it has to be an, an either or in this case, um, the training, I'll, I'll spend a moment on the training center and then we'll talk about the other things that are in this budget that we're doing for the very uh, purposes that you have outlined. But the, the, we, uh, Department of Safety calls it uh, Melita, or General Services calls it Melita. But um, this is th this is is much more than a than a single building that will you know that will be a training center. Uh, the, the, this this is uh, involves uh, corrections, it involves safety, it involves uh, commerce and insurance, also uh, TBI. Um, and so it it includes um, the uh, firing. Uh, I think I think multiple firing ranges. It includes a um, uh, a, a track that uh, that that they will train on from the stand from a, a automobile standpoint, or uh, being able to uh, to um, have that kind of training. Uh, there's multiple buildings uh, in, involved with the uh, with the uh, complex itself. There's also the the corporate 
uh, I call it uh, the corporate, uh, the offices for the corrections department would move from where it is now. This is a long-term, long-term plan that they would they would move uh, out there to that facility. So there's there's a it, it's it's not a single building that's a three hundred million dollar. It's a huge complex that would have all the training facilities for all of these. Uh, related uh, departments, um, so uh, it, and it, it would take some time to uh, to build. So that's the reason it has a big price tag, and it is a big price tag. I, I, I would agree with that. But I think I think training our officers, training those that are uh, out there to uh, with the purpose of, of fighting crime in one way or another, uh, is very important to being able to have state-of-the-art facilities to be able to do that. Having said that, um, there were there are a number of other uh, uh, other pieces of the budget that are directly related to doing what you're talking about. The grant program um, that we're talking about that goes to, to local okay. governments, $150 million in this budget for the exact very purpose that you are referring to. Uh, we're also referring, we've got 60 in that same slide, $66 million for supporting uh, law enforcement hiring, getting those right people that you're talking about and being able uh, to support that effort. Um, anything else I'm missing? Um, okay. So, uh, so I, would, I, I would just say that I don't think we have to take away. I think we're in a great position this year to where – uh, we don't have to do that. We're able to put uh, the the um, the focus uh, on being able to be able to uh, build that training facility, which has been years in the in the planning to be able to do that, and at the same time continue to invest um, in in fighting crime because, as as you pointed out, it's a very important thing that we do. So, yeah, thank you, Representative Miller. You have a follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. A different question. Under economic development projects, I think $77 million, are any of those dollars an extension of the mega site? Yeah, I, I, I do not think so. I would have to refer you to TDOT um, because they've got, they've got the specific projects. We've got it listed here. I don't think that one of those is... Uh, connected to the mega site. When we say uh, that's a, uh, the, the term that, that TDOT is using is relates to that. It's this is not economic development department ECD that is that it, that these projects are coming from. This is this is TDOT. Uh, these these are TDOT projects. These are road projects, uh, improvement projects. Many of them are uh, throughout throughout the state that uh, when that they are referring to to simply say that if we make these improvements, it will enhance the environment for uh, more industry or more development to be able to take place, which would be positive for that community. In addition to those projects, um, the expansion of the interchange um, program that they're talking about uh, is really the same thing. It has an, it has an economic development uh, um, uh, component to it, but these aren't projects that have a company that is related to coming to that project. Okay, it's it's uh, it's simply uh, economic development related to the community. Leader Camper. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Appreciate your presentation. Uh, and I know that you know F and A has been historically managed our spending uh, uh, well with available funds that we've had. And one of your slides, you talked about um, how revenue growth was going to begin to slow down. And uh, I'm I'm wondering when can we expect, or do you expect that our revenue base would also shrink? with that uh, simultaneously, or what are you seeing around, you know, the downturn in, in our revenues and? Yeah. 
his well, relationship to the um, budget? Just, just from a big picture standpoint. So when the funding board met that we referred to earlier uh, in November of 21, uh, we, we ended up raising the, the estimate um, which is the re one of the reasons that there's additional dollars in this budget, raising the estimate for fiscal year 22 up to an 8.5% growth estimate for fiscal year 22. At the same time, we, we put the growth estimate for fiscal year 23 that this budget is based on uh, at a 2.5% growth. And so all the economists that we heard from felt like that we were not going to continue to see those large spikes in revenue that we've been experiencing this year uh, roll over into fiscal year 23. And so out of, out of caution for that and the uncertainty that you heard Dr. Fox and uh, really each of them say, we don't exactly know what that's going to look like, then we have we have put this budget together with that in mind and have been uh, cautious to the point of saying, let's don't spend every dollar of the recurring dollars this year in fiscal year 23 on recurring items because nobody I know knows exactly what's going to happen in, in 23, in 22 and 23. And so, that's the reason building in this $1.3 billion of unspent dollars in recurring funds. We're spending the dollars, we're trying to spend them on these investments, strategic investments that we're talking about. But that's going to present cushion rolling over into next year's budget process that if, it, 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 you know, hopefully it doesn't happen. But if even if it's less than 2.5, if it goes south, we're going to have a cushion built in to where uh, we can withstand whatever storm comes our way. Leader Camper. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with respect to the 350, I think on slide 18, the 350 million that was put in TCRS fund. Yes. So we are directly transferring that from the general fund. To TCRS fund. Yeah, that's right. that's that. Yes, that's an internal transfer. Uh, so rather than spending it on some external, uh, in some some external way, um, by being able to do that, then we'll we'll be reducing that pension liability. So we're not going to make any rate adjustments or anything like that. This is going to put us put the fund in a better financial position. Uh, that's right. No, nothing else change right well, well i think the expectation is that with this additional deposit uh they'll do another actuary study and oh. hopefully that it will reduce our recurring deposit that's required that's to fully required fund to our, our our okay i understand thank you madam chair one last question no later camper yes, later. thank you uh last year uh, uh yeah maybe, yeah at some point yeah last year i had asked about the um COVID uh expansion requests we had and you and FNA normally I guess really required by law to provide a report back to the finance chairs on the details of uh the expansion in the worksheet form. Did we do that? Have we received that? If so, I'd like to get a copy of it. Okay. We'll we'll be happy to yes, we we ended up coming back through the expansion process so that uh you know so that there is uh, a trail there that, that shows where all those funds were expended. So uh, we'll be happy to get that for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Ogolds. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for all y'all's hard work. Uh, I just would like to commend the governor as well as your office. The, the investment that was made into law enforcement is really going to change our state for generations to come, uh, specifically uh, the, the investment in that crime lab and the TBI agents, uh, we've been really working on that for the last couple of years and just very thankful for your ability to fund that. That, that lab um, really is a, is a tool in our criminal justice system and is vital uh, for the operation of that. And it also, I'll remind everybody, it also 
helps exonerate the innocent as well uh, and processing that evidence. evidence. So thank you very much yeah. to the governor for his commitment for the, to that. Very good. Agree. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I, just from my understanding, the, the TCAT for the Blue Oval was in the budget amendment last year. Is that correct? Yes, that was well. It was in the special session. special session. Yeah, it wouldn't it wasn't in last year? It was in the special session. In, in the, the special. Thank you. Yes, okay, what, what do we have in reserve right now? How much money do we have in reserve that we just? I don't know if it's how it's budgeted or if it hadn't been budgeted or what can uh, reserve for funds what? in reserve funds the state. Tennessee. Well, Dave, Dave can uh, add add more to this, but you saw the slide here. the 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 main The main fund that serves as a state's reserve uh, is what we all refer to as the rainy day fund. So we've got one point six billion dollars now in that fund. Um, so. That would that would be what I would refer to as our reserve. Now there there are myriad other reserves that departments have or agencies have, uh, where they're collecting fees or they're they're, they're collecting revenues from services uh, that they provide. Where there may be uh, reserve funds set up for that department or that agency. Um, that uh, that retain those funds. Most of those are spent uh, for services or for improvements that are directly related to the services that they may be providing for that. And and uh, that list is is too long to go over here okay. here in the meeting. But there's there's a number of those uh, those funds that are set up that that are uh, classified as reserve funds, but. Uh, that also, but I think what you're referring to is that 1.6 okay. and 10, 10 care, uh, also has a, has a reserve that would be in addition to that. And the two together, we've got over, over 2 billion, uh, that is set up to be able to do that. But, you know, I would just keep in mind, it, it's a lot of money. That's a, and it's a great reserve. We've now built it up to be able to be at the place that uh, is is has dictated by by statute for us to be as a percentage of our budget to have on hand. Um, but when you're looking at a you know forty fifty million dollar fifty billion dollar budget, um, you know two billion dollars doesn't go as 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 far uh, if we really needed it as you might think. One last, thank you, Madam Chair. One last question: How? 52, I think we what 52, what this budget is 52 yes, and some pennies. Yes. Uh, how much of that is federal dollars? Right at uh, 20 billion, 19.8, I believe. Uh, uh, 19.8. Uh, okay. There it is. Oops, okay. There it is right there. So the the yellow in the middle is the federal is the federal dollars mm -hmm. nineteen point eight. Okay. So uh, and I I would point out um, just uh, just as last year when uh, I, I think that uh, was referred to the budget we passed was uh, introduced was forty forty one billion and some change um, and. There's been a lot of federal funds that have come in since then. Um, I certainly anticipate uh, that 19 billion figure to increase over the year, and that when we're sitting here next year, it's going to be higher than that. I, I have no clue what uh, what the number will be, but it'll be likely higher than 19.8. Chairman Williams. Thank you, Commissioner. It's always great to look past <laughs> David Hawk's head. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for coming here today. I had a couple questions. One, or a question in the statement. I noticed in the um, uh, in the base reductions that there was a line item of seventy-two million dollars.
because of the Sentencing Act. Last year, the legislature passed a bill to try to do a better job of making corrections operate in the same fashion in which every other Department of State government does as it relates to capital and funding yeah. prisons. I noticed that uh, we, we did make a reduction there. Is it because we took the money and put it in a different hole uh, as it relates to making preparation for future prison projects or, or uh, just wondered what, yeah. what the long-term goal there was? It's good. I'm going to let Dave respond, but, but yet it is, it is due to the, the different mechanism uh, that we have with that. So Dave can respond. Yes, because of the, the change, uh, it, it changes the way we calculate the cost of incarceration bills and also changes the way those dollars can be used. Um, so what we've done is redirected those sentencing act, that recurring appropriation that was already there at $72 million um, into basically to fund the cost increases for correction uh, and then some. So I think their total cost increases were $100 million. We used 72 of that to really fund fund that. And I think going forward uh, with incarceration bills, we'll just have to treat that a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, follow up. Yeah, Thank you. Me. So I, I guess the reason why we uh, we were doing that, the monies for operating our prisons and the monies for uh, incarceration were commingled. That's right. Right. So by uh, segregating the two, we could do a better job of budget planning as it related to capital. But if we're taking the money, if the resultant is that we're taking the money and using for operating capital, then we're still functioning the same way. And instead of the legislative, instead of the original legislative intent, I guess the goal of the General Assembly was to try to do a better job planning. Does this mean that we will have a capital list project in the future and we'd take that money and fund projects then or? So uh, the so what this means is the the correctional department of correction capital projects will com will be part of the overall review of capital projects and compete with other projects and we'll we'll, we'll fund those uh, individually and then if we do have an expansion of a facility we will know that we've got to uh, uh, address that recurring expense when it's when it's built I think that was the intent of the right. one of the tents of the sentencing act so we'll, we'll make sure that we track that I think years ago that was not happening mm -hmm. you know, long ago mm -hmm. and i think we're doing a much better job uh to to kind of follow that now and our commitment is definitely would we want to operate and fund op and operate something that we build for yeah. sure just a just an opportunity uh when we talk about the words long ago like you did a minute ago <laughs> when you and i first came here you uh, uh had much darker hair <laughs> but also uh, what what also happened is it's usually when you guys presented before this committee there was a a man sitting in the bow tie at the back of the room i wanted to make sure that we honored him and his service it's the first time we haven't had him uh here mike Dedman was a fantastic polit uh, public servant and he is to be missed and i wanted to thank you and your staff and the governor for honoring her, his service by including him in the back of the budget book so Appreciate that. Yeah. I just wanted to give a shout out to him, uh, his wife, and uh, family too. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Chairman Wendell. Hey. Chairman, may I address my questions to Mr. Thurman? Is that okay? Yeah. It's okay with me if it's okay right. with Mr. Thurman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Thurman, how long have you worked in this department? Uh, worked. In, how long have you dealt with the budget in Tennessee? How long have you reviewed the budgets or uh, prepared the budgets? Or? 34. 34 years? Yeah. Thank you. Could you clarify some of Dr. Fox's uh, comments regarding the growth of Tennessee's economy in 2000, the last 12 months? Okay. 2021. Did Tennessee's economy grow? It, it did, yeah. By how much? I don't know the percentage, but I mean, it was uh, uh, more than expected for sure. How much of a monthly budget surplus did we have in those 12 months, approximately? Uh, the last 12 months? Um, in terms of revenue? Um, is it 300 million? Is it more or less? I've been told 300 million. Is that right? Or is that? Uh, it's, it's, it's more than that. More than that. Yeah. 500 so, million? 600 million? That. Yeah. So when we when we closed the books June 30 of 21, we uh, exceeded uh, tax collections by uh, 
Um, total revenue is two point one billion. So five hundred million a month. It, some months we'd increase our surplus over our spending, right? I mean, it varied, but I mean, it was definitely. Uh, again, remember that the, the growth rate was, uh, I guess, addressing an uncertain uh, economic climate. So we we were uh, cautious, I guess, in our growth rate. The reason I asked the question is: Have you seen this type of a growth in Tennessee's uh, revenues in the thirty-four years that you've been here? Um, not without a tax increase. So this is unprecedented. We've never seen this before. Since Andrew Jackson, we've not seen this type I of- I can't uh, confirm that, uh, <laughs> just for the record. But, but certainly we're, we're in unprecedented economic times, regardless of whether you use the Austrian model, London School of Economics, Keynesian. This is something that Tennessee's never seen. You know, that, this, in all seriousness, is that's true. Yeah. Is it your opinion that the increase in our surplus is as a result of Tennesseans being very productive and producing more goods and services, or is it a result of the federal stimulus and push or the, the juiced uh, nature of the entire economy of the country, and we're on some type of financial high right now as a result of the money supply being increased, whether it's M2 or some other number, and also the total amount of stimulus. And for example, uh, the fourth grand division of Tennessee, where some of us on this committee live, our constituents received $1.4 billion of money from the federal government. And they spent that money and we collected taxes off of it. And the reason I set the question up is we've increased our budget a substantial amount. Can we expect to continue to receive the kind of income we receive as a result of spending if the Fed tapers with a half point increase in the next 30 days and or they quit buying eighty billion dollars, one hundred twenty billion dollars of bonds each month, and all this bad debt gets digested. Who knows where it goes? It, what is your opinion on what happens twelve months from now if the federal government stops printing money? Well, I would say your concern is our concern, uh, and which is why the budget we reflect we're, we're presenting to you reflects that. Um, the recurring, we're spending some recurring dollars on non-recurring because we don't know. And I think some of the professionals do not know either. But let I think me, that's a real Let concern. me chime in too, yes, uh, if I may. Um, I, th I, I don't think it is sustainable. Uh, I, I, think, I think what we heard from every economist that we heard from is that we cannot sustain the growth that we have seen on that chart. So, I mean, if, if you ask us the question, uh, I think the two and a half percent growth rate is a is a on target uh, growth rate for the fiscal year of 23. And so that's that's what I think is is legitimate uh, for us to expect for the year. Right. And, and I don't doubt the conservative nature of your department. I have full confidence in all three of you gentlemen and the people that work for you to do what you're supposed to do. But my question simply is. Is the bottom going to fall out if the federal government continues to taper, which they've suggested they're going to? And I'm not saying we're going back to 1980 yeah. and we're going to pay whatever percent interest. But have you considered the prospect of the federal government stopping printing money and stopping buying bonds by the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars? And if so, is the income we're receiving, is that going to stop or is it a result of Jerry Sexton's factory producing more goods and services, more couches and more chairs. Yeah. Is, it, is it a snapshot of Tennessee that we're so much more productive that we're re receiving revenue or has the federal government got this economy yeah. juiced? It's, it's a combination of, of all. It, there, there is no doubt in, in, in my mind, and I, I think this is what we heard from the economists when we heard from them in November. When you, when you put the amount of additional dollars in into the state as we've seen over the last two years over 16 billion dollars of, of dollars coming into the state um, from the federal government a lot of those dollars are going to institutions and uh, uh, you know not to individuals but when you have that and those people are spending those dollars which we've seen that's certainly going to increase the revenues that we've seen so 
so part of it is that. Part of it, though, is the fact that we have budgeted uh, more conservatively than most other states. And so when that happened and we didn't increase spending and we cut back to a status quo budget, as you all recall, uh, a year before last, uh, during the 20 budget. Um, so when it turned and we started getting more revenues in, then, then we've been the beneficiary of that. And that's, that's partially the dollars that you're seeing before you today. And thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for your sober assessment. And I do appreciate the sober uh, approach to the budget process. But my final question is, have you considered or do you consider the likelihood of a deep cut in the mm -hmm. next yeah. 12 to 18 months as a result that the barbarian may be at the gate? Yeah, I, I would say yes. I would say that, uh, that these, these numbers that you see before you today um, bake into bake into the calculus, um, so, you know, uh, considerable cutback. But you've also got uh, considerable continued demand uh, for for growth and so forth. That all on the balance, um, I believe that the that the uh, estimates that we have are sound. But as a hedge, that's the reason we're doing what we're doing to say. Let's don't spend every dime we got in our pocket. Let's hold some of that back. And that's the reason for this $1.3 billion that will be sitting in the bank waiting for us next year. And again, thanks for your level-headed approach. Yeah. It's appreciated. I think most Tennesseans expect that. I think they've got it this time. Thank you. Thank you. I think that conversation just points out the level of uncertainty that's out there. And even if we, uh, and hopefully the, funding board and the recommendations are correct and we'll have the 2.8 percent growth but then there is a question at least in my mind what the real base is that that growth is going to be based on what is the level set and mm -hmm. i think that is just something that um absent a crystal ball that works we really don't have a, a good way to determine at this point representative gillespie thank you madam chair uh commissioner thank you for being here uh, I'm going to shift back to this public safety on uh, slide 21. The support for local law enforcement hiring, 66 million. Uh, do you all have how that's going to be allocated yet in terms of counties, cities, departments? Um, and if you don't have it yet, um, I would be very interested in getting it once yeah. you do. Uh, do you want to respond? I'll, I'll, we'll need to get get more information and I, I would um, we'll, we'll be happy to get that to you and then uh, also as the as the department comes th they would be able to uh, give you a lot more information anybody want to oh it's commerce and insurance that's doing that yeah not uh, not safety but so we'll, we'll we'll make sure to get you some information from us uh, uh, but it'll be from them and so I think they can expound on it when they come I have no other questioners on my list, so uh, Commissioner, let me thank you again for you and your team for being here, answering the questions, presenting what is um, an unprecedented budget in terms of dollar amount, but uh, again, to echo things that have been said here already, we really do appreciate the conservative fiscal approach that the administration is taking and that we plan to continue to take as a body to make sure that, um, again, just because, as you said, just because we have a dollar in our pocket, we don't have to spend all of it. We can save 20 cents or 30 or yeah. whatever it takes. So, um, again, thank you for the time. And with that, we are, without objection, back in session. And we have completed our calendar for today. Is there any further business to come before the committee? I would remind everyone that budget hearings begin bright and early next Monday, 9.30. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, 9 o'clock. If you're at 9.30, you're going to be late. 9 o'clock Monday morning, and we will go through March the 14th. We'll be looking at the capital budget um, on Monday, first thing. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>